Later that afternoon, the first two episodes aired together to start a new chapter for the iconic Little Blue Engine. And now, viewers, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to a great new children's ITV series. For the first time on television, the stories of Thomas the Tank Engine and friends. Take it away, boys. After being in production for five years, Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends made its debut, and becoming a runaway success on children's ITV, attracting more than 8.5 million viewers, with all 26 stories adapted from the first eight railway series books for continuity purpose. It also featured a new spin-off publication written by Wilbert Audrey, Thomas's Christmas Party which appeared in print form first with illustrations by Clive Sprong. It also introduced the first seven steam engines of the Fat Controller's fleet, which were the core characters alongside Annie and Clarabelle, Terence, Bertie, and of course, the ever mischievous Troublesome Trucks, who were all brought to life on television and received critical acclaim to a much wider audience. Thomas is a tank engine who lives at a big station on the island of Sodor. He's a cheeky little engine with six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler, and a short stumpy dome. When the episodes first broadcasted every Tuesday afternoon, two of which were compiled into a 10-minute block featuring the name board sequence in between. A year later in 1985, the episodes were shown individually for a five-minute block. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends had been nominated by BAFTA in the category of short animation alongside Danger Mouse, Rupert and the Frog Song, and The Wind in the Willows TV series. The overall winner, though, was Rupert and the Frog Song. Oh man. However, that doesn't stop Thomas from continuing his success through merchandising, such as VHS tapes released by Guild Home Video, the Ertl Diecast range, Ladybird books, annual books, several postcards, Hornby models, and so much more. You're a really useful engine. Now for some fun facts from behind the scenes. Thomas and six of his steam engine friends were all made in Gage 1, using the components of Marklin for a basis of real live locomotives with extensively modified chassis, motors, and wheels, just to obtain a sufficient size and level of reliability. And new bodies were also constructed to represent the character's book counterparts, which took six weeks for modelers to construct. This includes the addition of changeable molded clay facial expressions made out of fitted castings, a pair of moving eyes using radio control, and the mechanism linked to a pump and smoke unit arrangement to make steam as accurate as possible. As for the human characters, including the fat controller himself, these were all made using both solid lead and plasticine for wide shots. For close-up scenes, some models had to be made in large scale. This would also include some parts of the scenes, involving a driver with an arm that could be moved to the waving position. Unlike the engines, most out of a wide range of rolling stock, including the troublesome trucks, were all scratch-built using parts from 10 mil range of Gage 1 accessories and fittings. The series was filmed out of a large warehouse near Clapham Junction using 35 millimeter film cameras and the sets were made in rostrum size and area and then used for sequences. Once that set was filmed, it was then dismantled and then replaced by another set for further filming. The soundtrack for the first series was all composed using the Roland Jupiter 6 synthesizer, including incidental music and character themes like James Gordon Percy Henry
and of course, Thomas the Tank Engine. Here is another fun fact regarding the series title, Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. According to Brit, she made a logical choice by choosing Thomas, because when there has to be a number one, there has to be a hero too. As far as publicity had concern, the series had reached headlines including Thomas the TV Star, and the books that the television show was based on had sold more than 8 million copies for both old and new readers when the series had first launched. In 1986, the second series was filmed and broadcasted on Children's ITV on September 24th of that year. Following the success of the first season, 26 more episodes were produced and adapted from the selected books including Edward the Blue Engine, Percy the Small Engine, Duck and the Diesel Engine, the Twin Engines, Branch Line Engines, Main Line Engines, Tramway Engines, and more about Thomas the Tank Engine. The latter was also published in the same year, as written especially for television due to a signed deal with Britt Allcroft, which meant the stories to be broadcast had to be in print form first. Christopher Audrey, the writer of the said book, had also written two further stories for Britt and David to adapt, Thomas and Trevor and Thomas and the Missing Christmas Tree a railway series spin-off story. An interesting thing to note was Christopher himself stated he was not best pleased with the result of the stories in the 30th railway series book due to the pressure to meet the deadline. The second series also introduced more characters such as Duck, Donald and Douglas, Bill and Ben, Trevor, and Harold the Helicopter. This was the first series to introduce the first set of diesel locomotives as well, like Devious Diesel, Daisy, and Boko. We diesels don't need to learn. We know everything. We come to a yard and improve it. We are revolutionary. As of this season, until the end of the 12th series, the television show had been filmed at Shepperton Studios. This is also the first series for the troublesome trucks to gain recognizable molded faces as opposed to their first series style look. Besides some new faces for the trucks, all human characters were made in resin from this series onwards so they could easily be moved around. Another interesting fact about this season, in which case, out of all the episodes that were originally going to be produced, The Missing Coach was also the missing episode. It was based on the story of the same name from the Twin Engines by the Reverend W. Audrey. It's the story of Donald and Douglas arriving on Sodor for the first time and things becoming very confusing for everyone, including the Fat Controller. Especially when Douglas forgot to shunt Thomas's special coach by mistake and both him and Donald swapped their tenders to avoid getting in trouble. According to an interview with David Mitten before his death in May 2008, the episode itself was in production in 1985, and halfway through filming, Britt decided to cancel due to the lack of action and a slightly complicated and confusing storyline. Here, gentlemen, are the facts. Number 10 has been shunting the yard. Your coach disappeared. We investigate. Number 10 um, disappears too. You, you can draw your conclusions. Please accept my apologies. The matter will be investigated. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The fat controller watched them till they climbed the station ramp. His shoulders twitched. He wiped his eyes. Douglas wondered if he was crying. He wasn't. He swung round suddenly. Douglas, he rapped. Why are you masquerading with Donald's tender? <laughs> Gordon was talking one day to one of these. When I was young and green, he said, I remember going to London. Do you know the place? The station's called King's Cross. King's Cross? snorted the engine. London Stewston. Everyone knows that. Rubbish, said Duck. London's Paddington. I know. I worked there. For home video releases in the late 80s, 
Pickwick Video, later renamed to Carlton Communications, released three sets of videos containing the complete second series alongside the best of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends VHS in 1991. The video collection re-released the three tapes throughout the 90s. 90s kids will remember. With the second series already aired, the life on television for Thomas is highly regarded at its peak in quality, as it still is today. A year later, after the second series UK television debut, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation bought the rights to the series to be transmitted on Australian televisions. Back in England, the show had once again been nominated by BAFTA alongside Super Ted, Paddington Goes to School, Max Headroom's Giant Christmas Turkey, Danger Mouse, and The Wind in the Willows in the short animation category. And the winner was, drum roll please, Super Ted! Oh well, at least Thomas had been nominated two times by BAFTA. Anyone's a winner after all. Join us next time for another year. Thank you all for coming to see us at BAFTA. Woo! As for Wilbert Audrey, he may have stepped down from writing any further Railway Series material. It was safe to say his son had picked up where he left off. But since 1984, after he wrote the new story, Thomas's Christmas Party, Wilbert went on to adapt some of his older stories, like Thomas Comes to Breakfast in 1985, and Thomas and Gordon Off the Rails in 1990. He even wrote two annual books in 1979 and 1980, with illustrations by Edgar Hodges. He also contributed to write several chapters to the Birmingham and Gloucestershire Railway for author P.J. Long. At this time, while Wilbert had been a president of the Dean Forest Railway Line since 1983, an 060 Hunslet saddle tank engine was named after the railway's president in 1987, going by the name Wilbert. Meanwhile, Christopher was finally able to quit his job at the Inland Revenue after 20 years when he was writing stories for Gordon the High Speed Engine and could resume his full-time career as the author at the helm. During the same year, the island of Sodor, its people, history, and railways was written by Wilbert and his brother, George Audrey, and published by Kay and Ward to limited print copies. Unlike the usual railway stories written by both Wilbert and Christopher, this book was exceptionally different, as it is described to be an encyclopedia of the fictional island. The Isle of Sodor was inspired actually by the Bishop of Sodor and Man. Hmm. And the, the Reverend was over there visiting the Bishop and he thought, Do you know, you know, I need a place to put my characters on being asked, you know, where are they? Where is this, this story's base? And he think Sodor's pretty good. So he created this imaginary island that was positioned midway between the Isle of Man and mainland Britain. Wilbert Audrey had this obsession to understand the island of Sodor, a place where all these engines could run and they could run authentically, so that there was no sense in which these were fictional engines. They were engines which followed their own true railway logic. Sodor is a great crossword puzzle. It's bringing together all these disparate, unrelated ideas and making them part of a whole new mythology. And there aren't many people who have done that. J.R.R. Tolkien, in creating Middle Earth, created his own land, his own language, his own geography, his own sense of place in which to put his stories. Wilbert Audrey is one of the few other people who has done that. A few decades prior to the book's publication, let's go back to the year of 1949 in which Tank Engine Thomas again was published to learn more about the universe of Sodor. My sister and I remember very clearly Father, on his day off from his parish work, would write and he would bring to the uh, tea table what he'd written because it was important that these things should be read aloud as they were intended to be. 
and uh, there was one occasion in particular where we had an input. It was the story of the race between Thomas and Bertie. We all felt that there was something not quite right. One of them had more hazards than the other. <laughs> um, but Father proved that they hadn't by drawing us a map. And well, and he was, was a stickler for the accuracy of how a railway worked, wasn't he? Absolutely, yes. All his stories and my brother's afterwards were based on anecdotes, documentaries, things reported that had actually happened on railways, so everything had to be correct. And sure enough, as he wrote further stories about the railways of Sodor, a very detailed map of the island was developed in 1958. Since then, it gets updated time after time and seemingly day after day. For both Wilbert and George, it was much like a jigsaw puzzle after all these years, with correspondence and conversation between them, and the Island of Sodor book also provided answers to all the readers' questions, like, why Sodor? Why did the railway choose the routes they did? Why have the places got such odd names? And so forth. In recent years, after the book was out of stock, it became one of the holy grails of the railway series to most people and on websites like Amazon and eBay. It costs more than 100 pounds for a seller's copy. If you're a serious collector willing to spend your hard earned money, it may be worth it. Although the price was and is extremely expensive, it could be a signed copy by both Wilbert and George themselves. Back to Sodor, it is approximately 62 miles east to west and 51 miles north to south. It has many railway lines, including the Northwestern Railway, the Scarlowy Railway, the Coldy Fell Railway, and the Arlesdale Railway. The Northwestern Railway has several routes on the island with branch lines run by Thomas, Edward, and Duck, and the main line travels from Barrow westward to Tidmouth through the southern part of Sodor. Bigger engines like Gordon, James, Henry, Donald, Douglas, and Bear, formerly known to readers as Diesel 7101, were all situated to run the main line. Then along came Sir Topham Hatt, the man in charge of all the engines on Sodor. They call him the Fat Controller. So far, there were two former controllers in charge who ran the railway, such as Sir Topham Hatt and Sir Charles Topham Hatt II. Their successor is Sir Stephen Topham Hatt. In the television series, Sir Bertram Topham Hatt is the only controller who is currently running the railway and can be a combination of the three aforementioned controllers as described. The Scar Lowy Railway both inspired by and based on the Tallyflynn Railway in northern Wales of Great Britain, is a narrow gauge line and the oldest railway on Sodor currently owned by Sir Handel Brown II, the successor of his father. Like the Northwestern Railway, there were three controllers who run this railway as follows, Mr. Mack, Mr. Peter Sam, and Mr. Roger Sam, the son of the second controller. In the television series universe, Mr. Peregrine Percival currently runs the railway from the ninth series onwards, whereas in the early series, Sir Bertram Topham Hatt ran the entire railway as well as his own, making Percival the second controller of the little railway. He is also referred to as the Thin Controller. And unlike Sir Topham, who rides around in his blue car, or Winston, and maybe Elizabeth, Mr. Percival can be seen riding on his red bicycle. Well, you know, to, to stay in shape. The Scar Lowy Railway itself was not only inspired by the actual railway line in Wales, but every engine, barring Duke and Mighty Mac, of course, were based on their Tally Flynn counterparts, including Scar Lowy and Renaeus. Tally Flynn, Dol Goch, Renéas and I were built together in England. Who asked Nancy? A Tally Flynn and Dol Goch. Tally Flynn is my twin. Dol Goch is Renéas's. Their railway is at Towin in Wales, and they're 100 too. They were green, 
and we were red. Callis Lynn and I had four wheels then, and no cab. We thought we were wonderful, and talked about how splendid we'd look pulling coaches. What about trucks? asked Nancy. Scullery chuckled. We had no use for them, he said. The line operates from Crovens Gate, one of the Northwestern Railway stations, and carries on to other stops like Crosney Curran, Glenock, Reneus, and finally terminates at Scarlowy, where the lake is also located for sightseers. The lakeside at Scarlowy has a loop line extension opened by the Duke of Sodor in 1965, not to be confused with a certain narrow gauge engine named after him, though. That would never suit his grace. There was another narrow gauge line called the Mid Sodor Railway, which closed in January 1947 after over 60 years of service due to its decline. Several engines, including Albert and Jim, worked on the line too, alongside Duke, Falcon, and Stewart. However, it was assumed that they were either all sold away or scrapped. Other than Stanley, the railway's engine number two, who was turned into a pumping engine for his carelessness, they never appeared in any of the railway series books, but they were made on a model layout of the railway itself by Wilbert. As for Duke, after the railway's closure, he was oiled and greased, then sheeted up and sheltered in a shed in Arlesdale for many years, until 1969, where Mr. Fergus Duncan controller of the small railway, and two clergymen found him. He was then transported by road and rail to the Scarlowy Railway, where he is now part of the family. As for the Mid-Sodor Railway, whilst the majority of it remained closed, some sections of the line were later rebuilt for the miniature gauge Arlesdale Railway, which opened in the spring of 1967. There were two stations in Arlesdale, and one of which was located at the northern end of town that was tragically closed after the service with the mid Sodor Railway had ended 20 years earlier. The second station, now called Arlesdale Road, is established at the southern end of the town to Olstead on the edge of the road by foot, and is still currently in service by the Arlesdale Railway. Furthermore, this little line operates from there to Arlesboro West, a top station where it connects with the Little Western that was run by Duck and Oliver from there to Tidmouth Station. Mr. Fergus Duncan, the small controller who was appointed by the other controllers and the owner of the Scarlowy Railway, both shared the ownership of the whole line together, and the Arlesdale Railway was very well known for collecting supplies of ballast from the old mines of Duke's old line. The new ballast that was extracted was used for giving the Fat Controller's Railway a new and stunning look. I can't understand, said Duck, why I've never heard about you before. The small engines all answered at once. We've only just come from our railway in England which closed. Your Fat Controller asked us to come and fetch ballast for him. And he said he'd bring us plenty of passengers too. Haven't you had passengers before? Asked Duck. Only in England. It's our first season here. Oh, promised Duck, then I'll bring you lots. Goodbye, goodbye. And he puffed excitedly away to see about it. The one-third scale railway fleet were Mike, Rex, Bert, Frank, Blister 1 and Blister 2, and Sigrid of Arlesdale. Jock was newly built and introduced in Jock the New Engine, written by Christopher Audrey in 1990, featuring the debut of both Jock and Frank. They were a popular attraction to holidaymakers throughout the summer on their passenger service, as well as taking wool from the farms for making clothes. Douglas and Duck came to look too. Douglas had just brought some empty ballast trucks along the branch line. He and Duck watched with interest as the new engine was put to his paces. He puts me in mind of my days in Scotland, Douglas remarked. Some of the engines up in the Highlands were young colour. Jocks, we used to call them. Jocks, asked the new engine, stopping nearby. Aye, agreed Douglas. 
No bad name for yourself, I'm thinking, eh, Jock? The small controller was delighted. Well done, Douglas, he said, and turned to the new engine. What do you think, he asked. It means you'd have to keep your colour, too, to give the name some point. Would you mind? Not a bit, sir, said the new engine. I like the colour, and the name would suit me fine. Excellent, said the small controller. That's settled, then. Thank you, Douglas. A splendid idea. And Douglas puffed away, well satisfied with his morning's work. Like the Scarlowe and Mid-Sodor Railway, Arlesdale has its real-life counterpart in Cumbria, England, called the Ravenglass and Exdale Railway, and all the Arlesdale engines were based on their counterparts, too. Like all engines, the basis of Burt is based on River Urt. However, in Universe of Sodor, Burt retained his original form, whereas River Urt was rebuilt in 1972, which you can see today at the RNES Railway. Then, there is the only rack railway on the whole island, called the Coldy Fell Railway, which starts upwards from the village of Kirkmacan to the summit of Coldy Fell, passing through Devil's Back, or Driomidigan, in Sudrick, of all stops on the railway. A mile below summit, the line runs along a rocky ridge. Always there is wind. Sometimes it is gentle, at others, it is fierce and very dangerous. Then all passenger trains stop at Devil's Back Station. But whatever the weather, stores trains and rescue trains must get through. The manager of the line is Mr. Walter Richards, who has a hard time taking care of all of his engines, including Patrick, formerly known as Lord Harry in number six, while Lord Harry Bahrain was the first chairman of the railway board. There were also a total of eight engines on the line, including Coldy and Godred. The latter was unfortunately scrapped after a tragic accident, and his spare parts were used to mend other engines. Although, we're not completely sure Coldy made the story up or not. Unlike both Scarlowe and Arlesdale, which made frequent appearances, the Coldy Fell Railway had only appeared one time in Mountain Engines, due to the stringent safety precautions and limited traffic of a specific mountain railway line. Its real-life inspiration was the Snowdon Mountain Railway in Wales, home to the real-world counterparts of the Coldy Fell Railway's engine fleet. And to top it off, out of all 11 engines in Snowdon, three of which are currently out of service. As the Northwestern Railway is connected to the mainland, Many visiting engines arrived to help the Fat Controller's engines with passenger and freight services, including Stepney, the city of Truro, Wilbert, and of course, the Flying Scotsman, who is Gordon's only surviving brother in the universe of Sodor. The Fat Controller said he had all been honored and thanked Flying Scotsman and his owner for their help. Please tell everyone, he went on, that whatever happens elsewhere, steam will still be at work here. We shall be glad to welcome all who want to see and travel behind real engines. This announcement was greeted with cheers, and Flying Scotsman departed to the strains of Will You Know Come Back Again, led, as one might expect, by Donald and Douglas. Additionally, there were many landmarks to explore on the island itself, even fewer places named after some engines like Henry's Tunnel and Gordon's Hill. Not only were there stations, but quarries, harbors, castles, and mountains, which were situated in many different parts of the island. One of the prime examples of Sudrian landmarks is Brendam, which is a top station at the end of Edward's branch line, and one of Sodor's most industrial harbors ever known, where big ships come in and go with passengers, cargo, and fish. Bill and Ben, would regularly bring in china clay from the nearby workings, which would be shipped to the mainland once unloaded from the trucks. So there you have it, viewers. The island of Sodor would be one of the most perfect opportunities for an ideal holiday for railway enthusiasts and sightseers alike. For more information about Sodor, its railways, its people, and history, 
the real lives of Thomas the Tank Engine site is worth looking up, along with the Sodor Island fan site and the Thomas the Tank Engine Wikia.